So, uh, so I will speak in English now because uh, in general, this seminar is in English. And I think it is very, should be very interesting for scientists to have some ideas about how science is done. You know, science is not just art, you know, like art that you have just, a, or you do a painting and you do this and you do this and this. There are some rules in science. And these rules uh, are, are clear in principle, but also you have a lot of uh, people that have one opinion and then the other. For instance, you have the scientific realists. That means there's a world out there. It's a world out there. Uh, there's an objective reality. And what we know is just we project our mind on this reality, okay? And then there, uh, there, there's the other extreme that is, in fact, uh, uh, it's in fact only in your mind what's happening. It's, it's just um, um, elaborated from your mind and the construct of your mind, okay? So these are these two extreme versions. And of course, there's an intermediate version also where you, you hook up both, okay? It's in the same time, it's reality, but at the same time, it's also construction. So that's that's so and the and the important notion here is truth. Of course, truth is very has been very attacked by a lot of philosophers and uh, in part scientists, but mainly from the humanities. It comes mainly the, the, these attacks are mainly from humanities, is from philosophy, from sociology of science, and so forth. So because they uh, more or less uh, think that it's just, um, it's just the uh, truth is just something that is artificial, that is only in one epistemic realm, like for instance, here in the West, West with the science and in, in other societies, they have other things um, um, as values, okay? So these, these are the, uh, but I, uh, so I focus on the truth because I think it's a very important concept and that is not uh, highlighted enough, especially now when we have all this in our societies going on with the post-truth, with pseudo-realities and stuff like this. I think it's really extremely important to address uh, this notion. So, okay, so what I will do, I will first uh, show you a definition of truth, then I will deal with some issues of truth and its criticism, strategies, and the, um, the, to really uncover truth in, in, the, in the biomedical science. So I will really focus on the biomedical science here. Then there are essentially causal theories and then solidified truth. And then I will uh, go ahead with some, some case studies. And there's one with is, is Semmelweis, the other case study on the COVID, and the, uh, and the third is cancer. And then I will also uh, talk about politicization of science and ideological inference in science. So this is the last uh, point. Okay, so the notion of truth. So when you look in the Merriam Webster, there's a lot of things highlighting up here. So there is the body of real things, events and facts, the state of being and the case and so forth. But for us, the major thing is the property as of a statement of being in accord with the fact or reality. So this is the classical notion of truth. And of course, we can have also in truth, we believe in truth that uh, is in accordance with the fact, okay? So, there are several issues. Truth versus, versus certainty. So can we, what type of truth we have? We have provisional truth. We have non-provisional truth. Uh, in science, is non-provisional truth really existing or not? That's the question because a number of philosophers especially in physics, they say, they say uh, all is provisional truth. And there's not really, a, let's say, more, more stable, stable truth going on. 
And then I, uh, so I discussed this concept with provisional truth and solidified truth. And then uh, during the path of discovery, you have fluctuations of truth. Okay, so you have it will fluctuate at one stage. For instance, when you uh, work on cancer, you will have uh, one answer for one question, and then let's say another answer for another question, and so forth. Then uh, another point is the language, because the language in the biomedical science is in general a label. Okay, so we, we label things often as, as entities. We name things, for instance, we name genes as specific entities. And then, uh, so, uh, and then we try to build between the, this, uh, these entities, try to build interactions. Okay, and these interactions may be uh, only two by two, two by three, three by four, and so, so forth. I mean, these interactions may be very, very complex. So that's the other thing, but the label, so it's not just like in physics, for instance, in quantum physics and stuff like this, where you have many equations, uh, where, where you read the equations and you predict with the equations, we have here fixed entities that in fact interact. Uh, and this at a cellular level and also, uh, uh, let's say also deeper, the deeper level. And the other thing is also biases. So we have all biases when we do research. We have all uh, we have all we try to hope that we get a specific result. Okay. So, and it can be that your hope uh, will be transformed in reality, but will not be truth at all. Okay. So you can have. Uh, in, in uh, so, so can have in fact this bias that you do experiments that will always confirm your hypothesis, okay, and then you end up in fake, okay, in things that are far from from truth and far from reality. And so, what's going on? So, this is an important point with, with the biases, and the uh, uh, often scientists they they try to verify okay so it's of, of course it's important to do the verification but if you are too hard on the verificationist principle then you may add you you may end up in falsehood okay so that's uh, another important point the other point is uh, scientific re relativism because in some areas especially in anthropology in the anthropology era, you have got, you have re relativist views about what's going on. Is in fact reason and uh, rationality in that sense? Is it is it project? Can you project it to all kinds of societies? And is there a specific function? Uh, let's say a specific epistem in each societies or not? You no, know? and this can be. Uh, for the truth claim for for beliefs and so forth so this is a this is an important notion and then causality and truth this is an important aspect because the because because causality will unravel truth in fact to some extent and now there is what judah pearl called the causal revolution and the causal revolution is very important because, uh, especially in, 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 in informatics and computer science, artificial intelligence, because if you learn, if you teach a computer to think in a real, in a causal relationship, then this computer will behave more like a human, okay? So the, uh, if you do on, only statistics or, uh, or things like this, you, so you don't have it. But now we have the causal revolution in artificial, in, in, in artificial intelligence. It will be applied uh, for sure. So there's, uh, it, it's very important aspect. So what is the criticism now, the notion of truth? So they have a number of philosophers. 
I cite only very few here. You have Nietzsche, Paul Feierabend, Kuhn, Foucault, and Lyotard here. Okay. So these are, uh, of course, Friedrich Nietzsche, important philosopher, um, 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 he, uh, who, who was really un anti anti reason to some extent, but he was mainly, I think, his work is mainly interesting as a psychologist. Okay, so he uh, he he as a psychologist, he did some he uh, he had some uh, important findings and issues and the uh, so so when you should read one thing of nietzsche is the ge genealogy of morals okay so the genealogy of morals is extremely interesting because uh, here there he described really at a societal level what's going on with uh, with the psychology of people is uh, if your psychology of of the hurt people or the psychology of people who want to know, okay? So this is the, this, 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 this is the thing. So it's extremely interesting. Then there's Feierabend, Paul Feierabend, philosopher influenced by, uh, by the critical ra uh, rationalist philosophy, but he was against it because he said that in fact, at the, so at the end, anything goes. And uh, he, I mean, if, if you phrase it simply, then uh, you would say that in fact, um, science is a kind of art. It's not real, there are no real rules to go ahead with science, just you can do this, you can do this, and then you, you do like a picture, so, so you paint it. But but you you can read this in detail and there's Kuhn also is a very important thinker. So Kuhn uh, was essentially uh, when you should read one book is the structure of scientific re revolutions because this is the it's this uh, main uh, thing which has been hugely 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 advertised and read and discussed and so forth. But uh, he thinks that you have normal signs and then each way from normal signs, there comes a critical point. And the critical point comes when your big ideas and concepts do not hold anymore, okay? So it's just a wave, boom, it comes and you have a, 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 certain, a certain stuff going, uh, certain stuff going on, um, um, anomalies, for instance, that, that appear in the theory, and then comes the scientific re revolution. Okay? And then after the revolution, there will be each, um, there will be a new, there will be a new start. Okay? So, so the revolution will, then after the revolution, you will have, uh, let's say, another framework, and people will then work in this new framework, which is the normal science so what we do now it's normal science all of us okay and it, it goes by ways for instance when you look on the newton's theory or re relativity these are two things okay and this were really the scientific re revolution and between those you did what we call normal science so this is his theory but then you know he it's he's inclined to re uh, relativism a little bit because uh, he, he does not say that the new knowledge is superior to the older knowledge, okay? But because we, we generally think there is a, it's a kind of accumulation, it's an improvement each time we get closer to reality, it goes like this, but for Kuhn, it goes like this in waves, okay? And he's not really saying, he's a little bit saying that each epistem from each, each period, in society specific to it, and you cannot say it's superior or inferior. It will just explain. Okay, and then there is the, the philosophers, especially the French school, uh, really, I mean, who really uh, said there's no such thing as truth, there's just a uh, uh, just, uh, relationship of power, and uh, all is a language game. So you have the language game, it's power. 
And truth is not, and each society has its own epistemic and science is just an, it's just an epistemic re reality like, like all the other ones and has no real truth claim in it. Okay. And then you have the, the sociologist of science. So the sociologists, they have the, for instance, the, the school of um, 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 essentially Blom Mackenzie, who have a sociology school in um, um, Edinburgh. And uh, these people, they have, uh, they are for the strong program, you know, so the pro strong program in, in sociology of science is also it goes a little bit like the Foucault scheme that, in fact, the verity uh, truth is not really, uh, really uh, important. It's just the social forces that, in fact, interact and that uh, shape, in fact, uh, the, the, shape the science and the knowledge. So, and then you have all the other, you have now critical social justice and all this, we will talk a little bit uh, later, uh, let's say about that, uh, which also re uh, re relativize also truth enormously. So when you look on the strategy as, uh, let's say as a scientist, when you look on how, uh, how this goes, we have two approaches. One is the hypothesis driven approach and the other the data driven approach. You have these both, and they can, they are in fact integrated because uh, so the data will generate a new hypothesis, and the and the hypothesis when we uh, examine them, we so so when we put them in on a trial on test, they will also generate data and so forth, and the data will be reinterpreted, and it goes like like that. But what comes first? So this is on the top, Robert Weinberg, who gave a talk here in Bordeaux for some, uh, some time ago, this was before the COVID. And uh, for, for Robert Weinberg, he's a famous, famous cancer researcher. Um, uh, he claims that he, without hypothesis, you cannot do that. He, hypothesis is in fact first. And from the hypothesis, we derived experiments, we generate data and so forth. But now there's also a counterpoint, for instance, Golub here in this uh, nature paper, it's already an older paper, but I think it's uh, very, uh, very uh, good to show you this, this two point of view, where you have, you have to generate the data first, and then you scan the data of regularities, irregularities, and then you formulate your hypothesis and so forth. So it goes from, from the other way around, okay? So this is, the, uh, this is mainly this uh, data-driven uh, um, um, approach. So now, so what I said already, so the data-driven approach essentially when you look on experimental experiment methods, for instance, DNA sequencing, uh, imaging, and so forth, starts with that, then you scan for regularities, irregularities, uh, irregularities and patterns, and then you elaborate hypothesis based on this data, and these are then uh, put under trial or test. So when you start from the hypothesis, then you formulate first your hypothesis, and then you, des you, you, you design experiments, uh, so to test it, that means to accept or to reject your hypothesis, and you can formulate afterwards uh, a new hypothesis and so forth, you know, that goes, get, that goes in fact on and on. So there you have this uh, both ways to, to see science. Now, of course, the data-driven approach is very, very fancy and a lot of people just generating data, 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 and then now afterwards you have to interpret them. But uh, sometimes the interpretation is really it's really difficult because you uh, you from time to time you you cherry pick your stuff. So you get all your data and you cherry pick what you in fact like, what you want, and so forth. And you have your own uh, own stuff and your own drive. So that's the 
that's a little bit the problem that you uh, may encounter. So we don't escape hypothesis. It's pretty clear in all two in all two settings. It's just the way. It's just the way we do it. Is uh, it's the departure, either from the data or from hypothesis. So now I will discuss how we provide truth in the BMS biomedical science. So first, there is the, is the causal inference. Point. There's the Bayesian statistic, there's the error statistical approach, inference of the best explanation, EBE, and the nomological network of cumulative um, um, evidences. So that's the, the uh, five points I will, I will discuss now. First, the causal inference. So the causal inference has been very well described by um, John Stuart Mill. Okay, so John Stuart Mill was a, um, an utilitarian philosopher in the 19th century, a very, very known uh, philosopher, wrote a famous book on freedom. So you should read that. It's, I, I think it's really, it's, it's really important, but he also was uh, so interested in science and he, uh, he defines this so the uh, if one in one time an event takes place and another time it does not take place and all the conditions are in common except one which exists only in the first event the condition which is different between these two events is the cause or indispensable part of the cause of the observed phenomenon okay so is this clear for you should be clear for, let's say, for, for everyone, no? So you understand what is here. Okay, it's, it's not uh, just like that. Okay, good. But you have to be careful with that because you need to have um, um, additional conditions and criteria. So the two situations that you compare must be homogeneous, okay? And the agent or the or the uh, what is behind it, the and, and the causal mechanism of the induced response must be present only in one of the situations and absent in the other. Okay, because otherwise we are not able to compare. Uh, and some other factors that might be involved must not be present at the time of the experience. So there must be co-founding variables also but, but but in some in uh, so in some in some causal inference you have the co-founding variables and then you fix these variables and then you can go ahead even okay so it's uh, it's uh, it's the way it's it's gone so the causal inference is essentially driver in the discovery in biology and medicine so it takes a uh, essential uh, 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 potential uh, causal co a connection between a molecular alteration and the phenotype. Okay, so that's the uh, that's important. And now, of course, the the causal inference has become big. You know, there's Ju Judah Pearl. Judah Pearl has wrote a book, entire book on on, on causal inference. Which is extremely uh, it's it's let's say hard to follow, but you could uh, you should read uh, uh, so a book a recent book that came just out of Ju Judah Pearl, uh, which I will show you at the end of the uh, of the talk. Okay, so um, now the Bayesian approach. So Bayesian approach is a statistic approach where we estimate. The, the, the incidence, or we, we estimate, let's say also, we estimate our belief that one hypothesis is true and it goes from zero to one, okay? So you can fix it uh, from zero to one, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So what you, you, you estimate, uh, so to be true. And then you look on a, in, so in fact, an association when you have A and B, 
So, so the probability of an event associated with a condition uh, X is the result of the probability of X multiplied by the probability of the event <laughs> that the event is associated with it occurs. And this is divided by the probability that the event occurs uh, in fact on its own, okay? So you have the probability, you, you uh, have a probability that is uh, there. So when you have the event R, for instance, is a hypothesis. And the test is B, okay? So we have R hypothesis and the test re result is B, okay? And with this, you can uh, have a, a kind of indicator how strong is your hypothesis in function of the result of your test, okay? So this is an, uh, this is an, uh, an approach that is used also in, in genomics a lot in, in all kinds of other um, um, areas. It's the Bayesian approach, but the Bayesian approach does not address a causal relationship. That is very important because the Bayesian approach, as Judah Pearl would say, is important, but it's not a causal uh, um, um, argument. Okay. Yes, the other one is the, is the error statistical approach. So the chance with which your hypothesis will pass a test is evaluated here. It's a little bit what I, I, I said before, it resembles. So the chance that the null hypothesis is successful passing the test, and if the probability of the null hypothesis is high, the observation is not due to the causal link. Okay, so what you have here, you have two type of errors. You have uh, the error type one. That means when you reject the null hypothesis, that means that your, uh, so your hypothesis is wrong, then you might accept a potential false alternative hypothesis, okay? But now when you accept the null hypothesis, then you may reject, let's say a good hypothesis. So yeah, you have each time a risk of either or too much rejecting or too much accepting. So you are uh, so you have to be extremely careful of this type one and type two error. Then the other thing is the inference of the best explanation. So this is really interesting because it's already in fears that we have some information about structure, for instance, uh, more in details, for instance, we know, for instance, that um, that the protein uh, has an activity on specific uh, receptors, on tyrosine, tyrosine kinase receptors, and has a, has, has a domain that is able to bind this type of receptors, but we do not know which receptor it is, okay? So then our best explanation here would be that this factor will bind to a subtype of tyrosine kinase receptors and our research program will identify this type, okay? So we, uh, we, we do not have to search on um, um, other things, for instance. We do not have to search that it may bind to, I don't know, to uh, sugars or to what, whatever, you know? We have to search, really, we have a strong argument that, in fact, there's a is a structural argument that this will interact with this type of, of receptors or proteins, whatever, okay? So then you have the nomological network of cumulative um, um, evidence. So you have one phenomenon to be explained, and this is often due to observational data. So when you generate observational data, you may have one argument, two argument, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and this will all, all converge to, to an explanation, okay? We, are, we can uh, also call this an, an explanatory inference, okay? So it will explain the phenomenon because, for instance, it's like when you are in court, you have... Uh, someone who is guilty for murder, and you have proof one, proof two, three, four, five, and six, okay, and seven. 
So that's what is meant here uh, with this. And it's interesting because I will show you an example of it. So now the causal theories, there are several causal theories. They have the old uh, with Aristotle that you know there were four causes, material, formal, efficient, and final cause. There's what I already said, John Stuart Mill in films, but also to, to the film now. It's, I mean, this all the, the causal inference field is very big now and uh, in the networks. And there's also the theory, it's the interventionist theory of causality. But I mean, Judah Pearl also uh, is doing intervention. So it's not, uh, but uh, James Woodward, he talked about it extensively. So I will discuss this quickly. So making things happen, a theory of causal explanation has been published already in 2003. And there's also papers now in 2010. And he gave also a talk, uh, I think at the Sorbonne uh, three, three years ago. So now um, when you look at this, uh, what says uh, with this interventional theory that is uh, when, when considering the following characterization, of what it is for X to cause Y, whereas the cause means something like X is causally relevant to Y at the type level, X causes Y if and only if there's a background circumstance B, okay, such as that if some single intervention that changes the value of X, okay, were to occur in B, because this is the back, this is all the background that you have then y or the probability distribution of y would be changed, okay? So that means you have, so the causal link and you try to perturb this causal link. And when this causal link is perturbed, then uh, y will change, okay? So that's that's the way, I, I mean, this is just the uh, a short, short, sen short sentence about all this theory, it's much, much more complicated, but it's so you so you should just retain this. You have an interventionist theory theory of causality. Okay. Now you need um, um, additional properties of causality. You need uh, you need causal stability. That means that if you change the background information and the causal relation x and y still holds, there must be a more stable and so so there must be two different causal relationships. One that changes in function of the background, okay? For instance, you can have in, you can have two cell types, an epithelial cell and endothelial cell. And then you see you have a causal re a relationship, okay? Between, let's say two proteins. So one induces the other and phosphorylation of the other and so forth. When you, when you evidence, for instance, these interaction, not only in endothelial cells, but also in epithelial cells, your causal relation is more stable. When you evidence it even in neurons, it's even more stable. When you evidence that in smooth muscle cells, it's more, and, and so forth and so forth. You can, so, so you can have a situation where you have uh, um, um, only a situation that is dependent on the specific background, on the context, and the other, which is more stable. So the other is what you have also is counterfactuals. What is a counterfactual? Counterfactual is, um, uh, is uh, what if not? That means that you have to ask the question, what happens if, for instance, X is not like it should be, so what happens with Y afterwards? And this you can formalize, can formalize this in equations and in a causal diagram, okay? So this is important because the, uh, the counterfactuals up to now, no computer can do it. So the idea would be evidently that the computer can do a counterfactual. And if it does, he, if he has integrated the counterfactual, then 
it would reason more like a human. It will not be like a human, but let's say more reason like a human. Okay. And then you have the you have the uh, the, the causal pluralism or monism. You have the choice between you have one phenomenon has more than one causes, or you have also hierarchy of causes. One is the is, is an ultimate cause and the other are, are just pro promoting causes. And you have uh, just the situation where you have really only one cause. And there's the causal specificity, which is also uh, that you have really this interaction is specific between X and Y and you don't, so you don't have anything else that will, that will interfere. And then you have downward causation. So what is, is downward causation? That means you have an, you have an framework and you have an explanatory framework. For instance, a phenomenon in cell, in the cell physiology that you can explain by, let's say biology, let's say, yeah, there's, there's one molecule identified that will interact with another one, but you can explain also by physics, okay? So, so the downward causation is in fact, you have an explanatory scheme in physics that may explain physically constrained. And then you have at the biochemical level, and these two may interact, these two may provide two explanatory systems, but which, which can be in fact uh, glued together, okay? So now the path to solidify truths. You have, you may have, at one in your in your path of discovery, you may have fluctuations and uncertainties. You have then you may have stability and more certainties that may be transitory or more permanent. Then you can will have, you can have again fluctuations, uncertainties, and then again instabilities and certainties, permanent, more permanent or transitory fluctuations, and it goes on like that, okay? So that's the, it's often, uh, it's, it's the general scheme that, uh, there, that is there. So now, what is a solidified truth? So people, in general, in physics, they don't think there's anything like solidified truth, okay? In physics, they think the, when you look on, uh, on uh, quantum physics, me mechanics, and, and other stuff, you, uh, you, you just describe uh, stuff, and you, so you just predict, and uh, there's no, no such thing as uh, a solidified truth. But we have, for instance, in biology, we have the cell theory. Biology, we have the germ theory. We have the blood circulation system. We have oxygen and uh, oxygen energetics. We have DNA and we have RNA. So to me, this is solidified truth because it constituted a framework where our science is evolving. And the, I, I believe the likelihood that a cell theory will be shattered in biology is very small, okay? So that's, uh, of course, a lot of philosophers that don't agree with that. It's just my view. It's just, I say that these are the building blocks that are, uh, that have a certain certainty. I don't say, let's say an absolute certainty, but these are building blocks that have a certain certainty in which we are doing our science, okay? Because it would be useless to do science when we, uh, would say we are still uh, believing on Flüger's uh, protoplasma theory, okay? What is Flüger's protoplasma theory in the 19th century? Flüger uh, was a histologist, uh, very, so he thought that in fact you have some, some nuclei and then around floating you have some, uh, some protoplasma around, there's no cell wall and nothing there, so, okay. So that's, okay, if we would think like this, it would be a no end and it would not correspond to reality, okay? This is the point. And that's why 
relativists are wrong and social constructivists are wrong. Okay. So I am uh, pretty opposed to social constructivism. But it's uh, so now uh, this is one example, William Harvey, which uh, already in the in the 17th century and already in 16, 1616, he he formulated his theory of the blood circulation. So this theory stands. This theory was a, is a framework for all other science that we are doing now. How 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 this science is evolving with the uh, with angiogenesis with I, I mean all kinds with the heart heart function of the heart pump hypertension I, I mean all what we are doing is in this and I do not think that in a vertebrate I talk about a vertebrate organism it will change okay so this framework for me is solidified truth and it's pretty stable okay so i don't believe that uh, it, one day it could be overcome so now uh, some example case studies semmelweis and the purpural fever very interesting case study so who was semmelweis so he was hungarian like me, but it's uh, it's uh, but but he was working in Vienna and not in Bordeaux, and he became crazy and not me. So I'm, <laughs> that's uh, that's a little bit the difference. But so he was uh, he was studying law at the beginning, and then uh, he went to Vienna. He skips law and then went to uh, medical studies, and then he he continues. In Hungary first, and then in Vienna back, he did a thesis on plants, which is was extremely strange, but uh, he, he did that, and it's written. In fact, in it, it's written very strangely in Latin. So it's uh, so I've seen this his thesis. It's uh, it's really awkward a little bit. But then he went. He become uh, he, he, his thesis in surgery and then he became assistant in in obstetrics so, so uh, in in vienna in a general hospital and then of course uh, he found so the causes of the of the purple fever it's very interesting how he did that then he uh, he went back to hungary and then at the end he started to become a little bit crazy so he he was sending all kinds of uh, of things to famous professors in germany in england also in france where he was accusing them that you you kill uh, pregnant women and because you do not accept what i'm teaching okay you do not accept, but but i will show this to you later so he was in his time an outcast uh, he was not not believed at all. So what was his stuff? His initial observation that was in in one clinic, you had one ward and you had another ward. You had two wards, and the first ward was mainly uh, were mainly there were physicians and students, and the other only nurses. Okay, but what he saw. There's a big difference because in the first clinic that you see here, you have a high dead rate. At one moment, 15 more, more than 15% die. Okay. This is just an example of this. And in the second, much lower, lower than 5%. Okay. So at that time, people thought. Either women were psychologically strange, either there was kind of miasma, so that means this kind of vapors that came out from, from, from bodies, uh, I mean, especially dead bodies that will go across walls and stuff, and then the poor woman will, in fact, in fact have it and get it and die from it. Uh, there were also uh, some stuff that mean that maybe there may be some stuff outside 
uh, rays from the outside, from the universe that came, and the, these rays would, uh, uh, would would affect women and stuff, and that would be uh, for this reason. And uh, this, uh, in fact, they have no clear, clear, clear explanation of that. So what he said, no, there must be a scientific explanation of it because you have to remind that at that time, the germ theory was not established. Louis Pasteur came after, okay? So without any germ theory, he had to reason and to do finally a kind of clinical and also experimental experiment to find out the cause. Okay, so what was belief? Fatality, atmospheric, cosmic, atmospheric causes, epidemic, unknown factors, women psychology, and so forth. But he did not, so he was not happy with all this. And he, he tested these hypotheses. This is one of his, his writings. I mean, he did all stuff in German. So it's, uh, uh, he, uh, he really said here that he very precisely, he examined the causes of the puerile fever, very with great rigor, okay? So, what did he do? He observed different mortality rates in two different located wards, maternity wards. The historical record, he looked at the historical record where no <laughs> dissection were performed. And when no dissection were performed, there were low mortality. The, when he looked at the date, uh, uh, that rates in 1822, they were lower because at that time, anatomical dissections were not performed. Then there are also time-dependent fluctuation, which are dependent on the stuff and on the dissections. If they were done, if they were doing a lot of dissections, they had a lot of infections. So what is uh, uh, what I'm saying by by the sections is that the, so the dead women they went in the basement and they were in the morning they were de dissected by the physicians. Okay, so that's what I mean by so by the section. So they had already in the as in let's say in contact with their hands some of the of the stuff. That what he called uh, what he called faule tierisch organische Stoffe. That means that some uh, some substances that were uh, that were uh, so I don't know how to say this in in English, but but substance that uh, foul. That means uh, uh, the the. Uh, I mean, I mean, bad, bad substances for uh, for the for let's say for your body, and then the uh, um, so sorry this one. Then when foreigners came, they did a lot of of dissections, and there they saw uh, there was an increase of that rate. Then he did an exclusion of psychological factors because they, he did this in two ways. There were, because there was a church, there was a, a, so there was a bell ringing each time and the bell ringing uh, of the priest when the dead, when the dead body uh, were taken away from the ward, there was always a priest leading this and with the bell he was in. And the people in the hospital thought, yeah, it's because of the bell and because of the psychology that will increase the, the rate of the purple fever. So he said to the priest, don't bell anymore, stop. And the rate was the same. Then he put also the women uh, in, in other positions. Uh, so on the side, it was also the same. So all these factors were excluded. Then what he had also was that in uh, women outside, they, they gave outside birth, for instance, at the entrance of the hospital, because a lot, they were pregnant, especially poor women, and they were unable to reach the hospital. And then they gave outside, and these, they had really very few purple fever, 
and the other was his friend, Olechka. He did also a dissection and he, 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 he cut his fingers and he got a general infection which was exactly the same as the purple fever, okay? So the idea, there must be a substance from, from the dead bodies coming up. Then he did his famous uh, experiment with the uh, chlorine solution where he obliged everybody to, to wash their hands with the chlorine solution, but it's not, you know, he's remembered only for hand washing, which is highly <laughs> wrong. You know, people have, uh, he has done really, he has laid the foundation of, of experimental infectious research, uh, yeah, it's, it's research on infectious diseases, sorry. Uh, and then the other thing was that in, initially, they were, you have to remember that they didn't have any ideas of germs and stuff like this, they didn't have any. So, so initially he thought it was only from, from the dead bodies, but he found also that when the, they examined the woman that has a cancer, so they examined them and then they, uh, went through the ward with the examination that the other women, they get all pure fever, okay? And, and one other had a knee infection. So the, the physician was touching the knee infection and examined then the women, okay? Had all pure fever. So the idea at the beginning, they were focused on one, which was the dead body thing, but then he, in fact, uh, came up with the, with the unified theory. So, and then he did experiments in rabbits where he took the exudate from, from patients and injected that in rabbits. Not injected, but put in, in the sexual organs of rabbits, okay? And they got the same symptoms as, as the women of, 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 for the purple fever, okay? So, so you see here, for instance, the chlorine hand wash, boom, it went down. This is the, is, is the critical experiment. So, uh, famous philosopher Hempel, by Karl Hempel, he used this example to show how science is, is going on and so and moving. So he used it as a kind of case study in his, in his book. So, this is his, uh, his writing, so I will not go through it because we have already uh, said it, but what comes out of this, uh, first he did an elimination by simple observation of facts, okay? Diet, crowd, cosmic radiation, atmospheric. Then he did an interventionist approach. So the interventionist approach, he eliminated psychologically the position of pregnant woman. He did the chlorine treatment, which is an interventionist approach to uh, have, a, have a causal re relationship. And then he, so, uh, so this, this follows when if H is true, so is I. So it's the test, the, the, the hypothesis is true. So, but when I, the, uh, the, uh, the experiment and the test is not true, H is not true. So this, this holds. But the problem is, the problem is here. When you have, uh, when you have this, if H is true, so if the hypothesis is true, then so is the test, so the, the test hypothesis. And when, when the test hypothesis is true, then this is claimed that H is true. But the problem is you, you cannot claim this because this is a pure verificationist principle. You may have a wrong hypothesis. You may do just the experiment to support your hypothesis. And then your hypothesis uh, will be reinforced, okay? So that's the that, 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 that's the idea. So it's uh, it's uh, if you apply the, the verification is principle alone, it's not sufficient, and you may have false conclusions. Okay, 
So he could, for instance, apply in uh, similar wise, just a verificationist principle. That means that the hypothesis that, uh, in fact, the, the puerperal fever is due to putrid stuff in dead bodies. And that's the hypothesis. Then he shows that is in dead bodies. Yes, okay. So he's, he's doing the test and then he re reinforces the hypothesis. But the hypothesis is in part wrong and incomplete because it's not only putrid stuff in dead bodies. It's, it's a septic agent, okay? It's a septic agent which is much larger than just one specific case, okay? So this is why when you do just the verification is principle, you may end up just in claiming that these are only dead bodies, so, so in your hypothesis, and not the real causal agent, okay? So what he did, in fact, is this semmelweis nomological network of cumulative evidence. It's exactly what he did. So here's a historical. So, so yeah, I put that here in frame. And he already talked about the septic agent, the single septic agent. So he was pretty convinced that this is the, uh, the situation. And of course, this has been taken up afterwards by other people, but he was very um, criticized and not at all accepted in his times. So what we have is monocausality. So there's the idea of a, of a septic agent or, or multicausality, where you have independent substances that may trigger this, uh, so this effect, okay? But in fact, uh, so he, he shifted from monocausality to pluricausality, and then however he back shifted to monocausality because he was claiming there was a septic agent single septic agent, which has been proved, proven afterwards by the, by the germ theory, okay? So there's this causal relationships, uh, so either a, a, a priori, so, the, so you just observe uh, the stuff, and there is also the, the, the intervention and the inference. So I talked already about that. So this is what he wrote to, uh, to famous professors in Germany, for instance, or in Vienna. He insulted them, really. I mean, you are killers. You, you, do, you don't accept my teaching, and you are killers and liars and stuff. So it's, it's very, when you read this, it's really tough. So I, will, I don't have the time now to, so, so to translate it, but he insulted them. And he insulted them a lot, you know, like, like, uh, uh, like uh, they, uh, so they told, they said to them that you are ignoramuses, that you are totally, totally idiots, you know. I mean, he, he wrote this really to them, and you, you can read, so you can read his letters. But the thing is that he was an outcast this time, so no one believed him. So now the, the general idea, if you have unconventional ideas, often your unconventional ideas, when they, if they are out of the mainstream, they are obligatory wrong. For instance, there's one thing that I was in the New, New York Times, that is this kind of sift uh, theory of Caulfield, but this is applied not to science specifically, but to search on the internet of true information, okay? So sift stop, investigate the source, find the coverage, the better coverage, trace claims, quotes, and, and media back to the original context. 
And there were also some theories that uh, were uh, not, let's say, in the mainstream. Of course, these theories were wrong, but however, what he said here is very bad because he said it's outside of the consensus. When you are outside of the consensus, you have to be have to have very strong data, okay? Because only very strong data can breach it and can claim truth. The problem is, for instance, with hydroxychloroquine and stuff like this, this data were just bullshit, okay? So he was outside of the consensus, but with bullshit. So if you have if you have bullshit and you try to claim for truth, then of course it's a dead end. But if you have very solid data, for instance, how it how it came in for the re retrotranscriptase uh, re retrotranscription, because the the general dogma from DNA is goes DNA RNA and not reversed. So how it came in identified the retrotranscriptase, and he was outcasted by the scientific establishment. He went to the meetings and said, look, I mean, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. This is idiotic and stuff. But at the end, uh, it was true and he got the Nobel Prize for it. Okay. So outside of the consensus from time to time, you have to have extremely strong data and then you can make it. This is not for science. So you should not dismiss heterosexual thinking, but you should also careful about pathological science because science may go mad to some extent. And this is, uh, let's say Irving Langmuir. It's a very interesting paper. It's, uh, so he did a, a conference in 1953 and where he in physics, uh, so identified science of, of mad science. So one thing for instance, that the causative agent, the effect of a causative agent is uh, as low sensitivity, okay, and the, and in fact, the strong and the magnitude of the effect is substantially independent of the intensity of the cause. Okay, so you may have, uh, let's say an agent that induces an effect, but you don't see the effect in, the, in, in function of the amount of the agent that is inducing the effect. And your effect is pretty low and close to background, okay? Very careful when you have that, smells like artifact, okay? So the other stuff is that, of course, what he said, the magnitude that remains close to the limit of uh, the totality or may be measured are necessary because of the very low statistical significance of the results so have often low statistical significance, very low. So the, let's say with the errors, and that's why we have to be very careful when we do experiments, when we, when we have only weak, weak changes and stuff, then uh, let's say often, uh, if your claim is too strong, then uh, it's, it's just plain wrong. And there's also claims of great, great accuracy. You see that with um, um, hydroxychloroquine. Classical example proven by uh, all kinds of studies, we know that. Then, fantastic th theories and, and ad hoc and uh, um, um, auxiliary pseudo hypothesis are invented to explain it. And then, uh, excuses, of course, when criticism comes. And uh, the, let's say, in a, at a sociological level, the amount of supporters will at the beginning be high. You see it with hydroxychloroquine and then boom, go, go down. So this is classically uh, a pseudoscience, okay? And it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty clear. So now the, the, the other example is the COVID. So how tooth claims are changing in the COVID. 
So the two scans are chenic for instance, is primary was primary lung disease, and then the second comes up that COVID is a systemic disease affecting the lungs and circulatory system, kidney and brain. Okay. So that has changed. Then true claims of using protective gear. This has changed too, because at the beginning, surgeon general in the US said, mask, no use. And suddenly the, the mask very important, especially FFE2. Huh? So this changed, changed also. And the other thing, so is the origin of the disease. So, so initially food market and intermediate species has, has not been found. There was a lot of claims that have been not been found. The intermediate species is not identified up to now. There's now the lab leak hypothesis, which uh, is there, but which is heavily attacked by a number of people, even though you will have a, you will have a talk by, by Aline Chan, who wrote the book Viral. Uh, she will talk about that 4th of July. So you will have more, uh, more uh, information about the origin of, of COVID. So she works at the Broad Institute, in, so at Harvard. Uh, voila. And hydroxychloroquine, of course. Uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and then, you, so what is, is the solidified truth? In COVID, that you have the virus, that you have the ACE2 receptor, that uh, SARS CoV uses spike protein to enter the cell. So, this is solid, replicated X times by a lot of labs. They're working on that and so forth. And that, but there's true, true fluctuations also, which, which are moving, you know. So, the, the thing is that. Uh, uh, so these truth claims may change also because of pressure. For instance, China is pressuring a lot for the origin of, of COVID, not to find out the, so, so the origin of COVID. So what, what they did is a, is a kind of travesty, okay, with this, uh, uh, with this uh, um, um, OMS or stuff, uh, what they did as a travesty. I hope that it can be solved. And this is, um, I, I think, an interesting point. So there's the other thing is the, is the vaccination side effects. So when you look on the, the vaccination side effects, there's a low risk, low risk in the general population, but there is a vaccination induced thrombotic thrombopenia that is pretty rare, but still there's a signal. So when you look in the in the statistics, it's a clear signal, and you can explain it as a, at a as a physiopathological level. Okay, you have an explana explanation for it because uh, there is uh, it's in a younger population. There are antibodies generated that are anti plated factor four antibodies, and that uh, that are activated. And of course, anti plated factor four antibodies. Will uh, will activate platelets. That's clear and lead to thrombosis and bleeding. So what you have is the causal stability is weak because so the incidence is real. It's only in in this context. It's of course uh, high. You have high background sensitivity because a lot of people but don't have it. Okay, they, they, they don't have thromboembolism. So that means that in the population who got the thromboembolism, there must be some specific background exist in this population, okay? So high restricted background sensitivity. There's also time dependent factor that is important because it's after, and there's also counterfactual evidence can ask a question, if not, if they would not have been, been vaccinated, then they would have no signal. And there's the EBU, the inference of the best explanation that is uh, clearly there because we have an explanation, a physiopathological explanation for it, okay? So that's, I think it's a, now, now cancer, I mean, as you know, there are liquid tumors, solid tumors, 
local invasive and so forth, the metastatic, and then uh, you have all, you have, for instance, this is the breast cancer and you have all these steps and each step, you have a causal explanation, okay, for each step. So the causal explanations are following one to the other. There's one for the primary tumor, uh, grow, transformation. There's the other for the expansion, the other for the invasive process, the third for the transmigration, how that is going and why and so forth. Then the seeding and the periphery also causal. So you have a lot of changes in the causal, in the causal, um, um, let's say events that in fact are unfolding. And you have to look on everyone and then to link them also together. So that's, and of course we did uh, with, with uh, Lucie Laplan uh, and so forth and uh, Lamonnier, Deluc, uh, and Thomas Pradeau, we did a paper on the multiple layers on the tumor environment where just this is a kind of conceptual uh, uh, illustration. What is the tumor environment? And you have a, a close tumor environment. You have the whole, whole organism tumor environment, which is, uh, is impacting the tumor. So you can read this paper when, if you like it. But this is, uh, is an important factor because the microenvironment and the tumor environment in general plays a critical role. So there are two causal theories in philosophy and in science. So when you ask Robert Weinberg, Robert Weinberg clearly said there's no one, the, the SMT, somatic mutation theory, okay? Because the, in, so in the somatic mutation theory, you have first uh, uh, proliferation clonal expansion, you have the TME that is recruited, and then the dissemination, okay? So the, the, so the path is first alterations in the tumor cell, second, the microenvironment, and this will be recruited and reinforced and have also causal, very, very important causal role. Because for instance, you can treat them with, with PDL1 antibodies, so with the immune system and so forth. But there's another theory which is called the TOFT, which is mainly uh, by philosophers. Uh, this is the, uh, so, so the TOFT is the tissue organization field theory and the philosopher's writing a lot because the environment is doing everything, Gene is doing really, really zero. And uh, what they claim is that there's a disruption of the tissue ar architecture first. And then the, uh, the mutations, if they are, are important, are occurring secondary, but there's mainly a, an activation of the tumor microenvironment, which is important, which leads to tumor expansion and so forth. So that means that in this theory, the uh, gene-centric and cell and tumor cell-centric view is secondary. That means that the environment is doing everything and the mutations are just um, there, they can exist or not exist and so forth. And then maybe they can a little bit help, but they have just a secondary role, okay? All the big scientists, they do not believe the Toft. All the big scientists believe the SMT, but all the philosophers believe the Toft. All, let's say most of the philosophers believe the Toft. The problem of the Toft is I didn't see really concluding experimental evidence for it. There are arguments, for instance, in the skin that you have driver mutations. So when you do uh, your sequence, you take out a part of your skin, you get the cells, you epithelial cells, you check if there's driver mutation, you have them, but you don't get cancer. So this would be an indirect argument of the TOF, but up to now, to me, they, some of the, these people claim that in the TOF, they, there are some let's say, arguments that are in favor of it. But to me, they are absolutely not convincing. 
So up to now, the experimental proof of the Toft stays still and has to be uh, has to be done. And this is why they don't they don't publish in Science and Nature. Okay. <laughs> So that's the same, but there's also one, this uh, Mina Bissell. So this is a little bit more, more complicated. She's not so uh, radical, but she said also the phenotype is very important because the phenotype is, may be more important than in fact the genotype in some respect, which may be true, but that uh, does not mean that uh, the phenotype, that means the, the surrounding tissue uh, is in fact the starting point. Okay, you may have a starting point really uh, in in a mutation, but then the phenotype, the phenotypic effect may be so strong that in fact it will drive the cell like hell. Okay, so if you won't have these phenotypical uh, changes that means, for instance, in the microenvironment with the immune, with the endothelium, with all this, you, you wouldn't, it would not happen. Okay, so that I, I think with this I'm agreeing. So now, when you look on on the causal, uh, so there are two philosophies of cancer that you see. The one is the more or less, the, let's say, the tumor centric view. The other is the Toft view. The uh, uh, let's say that things are outside of the tumor then uh, you have uh, deterministic and stochastic causal explanations. Then you have uh, a number of re relative strengths of the various causes of the types of causes involved in cancer. Then you have uh, different causal explanations for different stages of the disease. And then uh, you have organ specific, organ specific nature of the, the metastatic process uh, and the nature of dormancy and causality can be nonlinear. And there's also the downward uh, causation because you have matrix tension and stiffness, which is inducing, uh, which is inducing constraints and uh, changes of the phenotype. Okay, so when we compare infectious disease in this perspective, in the causal, so in the causal perspective, we see infectious disease, you have monism, the causal monism, a, a, mo, a monolayer, so you have one, one causal effect that the, the causal relationship is more stable, is more specific, there's no downward causation, the causal properties are deterministic and the causal standpoint is not evolving. For the cancer, it's very different. You have causal pluralism. You have a lot of additional causes supporting blah, blah. You have more layers. The uh, stability is less stable. You have the causal specific specificity is not as specific. There's downward causation, yes. Uh, causal properties, it's deterministic and stochastic, and it's evolving with tumor progression. Okay, so the, your, your explanatory change. Is, so what is, in fact, cancer? It's like a cubic picture to some extent. So it's not, we have not a unified understanding of it because you have all these all this interferences, uh, let's say, everywhere. So now, politicization of science and ideological penetration. Okay, so I have to, uh, a little bit long, huh? so it's, but, 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 but it will be soon finished. Huh? Science and society have strong interactions and are, in the, are interdependent. So we, we know that because for instance, grant money and, and orientation of science is important inside of society because they want also the money back you have some so the society gives you money so you, they want have a reward and that's important because uh, uh, we are funded and we we are dependent on society and on the orientations that society gives to science so in that sense 
politics and science going together. But the difference is ideological penetration driven by politics and political activism. Very different, not the same at all. Because there, there is there are ideological preconceptions that will dictate from the top what you have to do and what you have to believe. Okay. And there's a classic, the classical example, of course, is Russia, is, is the Soviet Union with, with Lysenko. And Lysenko uh, was a kind of uh, guy who refused, refuted the ge genetics, uh, Darwinian theory and genetics, the Mendelian. So genetics, and there were uh, Vavilov, who was a geneticist, the famous one. Uh, and he was also traveling around in Europe, in the USA, and he was working with Hunt Morgan in the USA, and I think in New York. But uh, he went back, and then he was treated like an outcast by Stalin. So he was put in jail, in jail and he died in prison. And, and all other ge geneticists also was the same. And uh, Lysenko with his theories, he came on the top, but it was a clear, a clear disaster because the, um, all the agriculture, uh, let's say initiative that he did failed. Everything failed was a big disaster and was also contributing to, so to the Great Famine in, in, in the Soviet Union. So is this uh, problem. So now what happens today? There is two, there's, so two recent, there's Anna Krilov, two, so two recently, I know her pretty well. She's an outstanding uh, scientist. So one of the top range. Uh, she is Ukrainian, but works in the uh, in the U.S. as is love there. And uh, for her, the uh, normalizing ideological intrusion into science, the Abandoning the Mertonian principle, will will cost us dearly. We cannot afford it. So it's a big article. You should read it. Very very interesting. And there's the other guy, Philip Ball, who is a science writer in London, who attacked her viciously and he uh, said that seen this way so he cites one other uh, person who is a social uh, i mean uh, is, is a social scientist scientist the idea of science as a value neutral activity is a myth okay not only is patently untrue but it is also poor strategy for winning public trust why would you believe and trust someone who professes to bring no value to the work, to do it free from all ideologies, biases, and social preconceptions? I think the last statement is a kind of outrageous, uh, outrageous interpretation. So what I did, I wrote articles and I supported Anna Krilov. So you can uh, look on that, this is on the counter white uh, website. This is another uh, 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 so article. But so what's happened now? You know that I mean all the cancel culture is going on. You know the uh, uh, Newton's law because it's a white supremacist. Okay, then quantum of supremacy has to be suppressed because the word supremacy. Ma ma master password, dummy variables, normal has to be suppressed because normal, you have people who are not, there are no such thing as normality. So we don't have a normal pH anymore, okay? So these are, let's say outrageous claims and we have to go against all this and Rather than focusing on point Kilov made, Ball attacked a straw man on his own creation. Diversity in science is subject discussed nowhere by Krilo. Uh, focusing on this topic, Ball creates a false impression that Krilov's paper is at odds with the important issue. This is ironic as Krilov is known for promoting gender equality in her field. Okay, so this is totally outrageous and he attacked me too by 
a long post, so we have a back and forth. So, so what is important is here. There is the, is the kudos principle pretty old because a lot of the new uh, science studies on the sociology of science, they don't think that is of any value. I mean, Bloor and McKenzie, for instance, they, but for us, it's of value because you have the, the kudos principle. It's a very important principle. You have universalism that you have to share communalism. So you have to share all your stuff. You have disinterest and you have organized skepticism. And now you can compare uh, the normal, normal epistemology that is ongoing, that you have provisional truth, you have fiabilism, you have objectivity, accountability, and pluralism. And the social justice epistemology, you have deny of existing truth replaced by concepts, uh, or the concept of which replaced. By, by alternative ways of knowing, state claims are true, are merely claims of power. So the, the truth has been replaced by, by power claims. Rejects that the theory can be proven or disproven by the empirical process. This is, uh, I think, for, uh, for the West. When you look on, on Western science, everything is done by the empirical process. And we have uh, built hospitals, we have found the structure of DNA and so forth. And the denial of legitimacy of other viewpoints, and this does not admit any criticism. Okay, so that's it. Just concluding re remarks, a little bit long. So I cite these two things all the time, even in my um, honoris causa lecture, I put them at the, at the end. Uh, so now the characteristic doctrine of modern irrationalists, as we have seen, are emphasis on will as opposed to thought and feeling that we have seen will, for instance, for the for some of the uh, of the, the philosophers is just a, a social social power and will that is going on glorification of power that we have seen <laughs> belief of intuition positing of propositions as opposed of observational inductive testing. That's very important. You know, you have the, first is the purely intuitive and subjective way to think. And the other is the scientific way to think. Okay. So by, and this is a very important, this was a paper in 1987 in Nature. Since then, uh, nature has changed a lot in terms of opinion. But at that time, uh, Theokakis and Psimopoulos, they stated, by denying truth and reality, science is reduced to a pointless if entertaining game, a meaningless if exacting exercise, and a destinationless if enjoyable journey. Okay, so you need, we need absolutely truth. And this is just for further reading. Oh, this is this is just for further reading, so you can look on some of my papers here. And there's an interview about Semmelweis and a podcast, France Culture, about Semmelweis, so you can listen to that. And you should read these three, three books. Theory of Reality, Peter Godfrey Smith. So my way to think is pretty close to his. Okay? Then Judah Pearl. The book of why and the constitution of knowledge by Jonathan Rausch. So these are three books you should read because you will learn a lot. They are pretty easy to read and I think nice uh, to follow and you will get some background what uh, is in fact scientific thinking. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. It was a little bit long, but... Okay, even if it's a little bit long, I think it was useful. So now uh, let's say questions. There any, are there any questions? Yeah, there are no questions in the chat. Have you any questions? Be free, ask, don't be shy. So what? 
So what did you understand of all this? So did you understand uh, the, uh, so what I was talking about, so, so the basic, let's say concepts. So have you understand that? So did you understand it? Yes, no, yes, no. So how for you, how for you, we, we should proceed in science. So what would be your, uh, your way in doing it? Is it more or less, uh, more or less uh, the cl classical uh, way of doing it? Or, or would you go, or would you go for this? Would you go for this? Or would you go for this? I think to me the answer is pretty clear. I mean, if you are if your your brain is not infected by ideology, you go for this. If your brain is infected by ideology, you go for this. And this can be ideology from the right and the left. Okay? So I don't exclude anything. I just say it's ideology. And when you pour ideology into science, and this is why this Philip Ball is a very uh, strange guy, you know, so uh, because he is just talking around, around the stuff, around the real thing that we are, we are in fact talking about. He's just talking around it what we call a kind of sophism. It's not really, it's not uh, there to understand really things. And, uh, but it's, it's okay. I mean, so maybe one day I will contact him and discuss him with him this stuff, frankly, in a little fist fight. But it's not, <laughs> we will see. Okay, so, uh, so have you any, any other things? So and then I think uh, we should. If you don't, if if in the in the audience there's no question, then we should uh, close this. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, those people, for attending.